straight basketball talk, no gimmicks. I won't go any further than I have to go here, but I just had a few thoughts basketball was not my gimmick on YouTube, but I was watching I would say most of the um Yukon LSU Iowa game and a good chunk of the um the Yukon and USC games. Uh first USC jerseys and uh, uniforms fucking terrible. You got gold and you got red. It's hard to make a bad combination out of red and gold, but somehow they did it. Um, just first analysis there. Secondly, actual basketball talk. <sighs> to me, like what people want out of women's basketball or what they're getting out of women's basketball isn't even like necessarily specifically about the quality of the games. I think A, the individual quality of the players, fan fucking tastic. You got uh Hannah Hidalgo, uh you got Beckers, you got Ice Brady, Elia Edwards, Cameron Brink, um, you got I forgot my AC was on, you got Caitlin Clark, you got Angel Reese, you got Flo J, you got um I shouldn't have got up when I didn't have underwear or didn't have pants on. Hopefully it doesn't get caught in there. But you got all of these incredible individual talents. Pretty much, I would say, more or less, the best era of individual talent that women basketball has had. Let's say transcendent. Like, literally, you have to watch them. Like, I'm not saying that, obviously, they had, like Brianna Stewart, Brittany Griner, uh, you know, DeWanna Bonner, all these Hall of Fame people like the you know late 2000s or early 2010s. Um, I'm not going to pretend like I was watching basketball, like women's basketball like that, to even say the talent was worse or better back then. I will say that I do feel like it only makes sense that with men, men, middle school, high schoolers, putting more into their crap than we've ever seen before. And girls, uh, girls, women, I, I, I just use these interchangeably, I guess. But with middle school and high school girls doing the same, it makes sense that when they do become women, when they are going to college, they are more talented than previous generations. It's the same discussion argument that we use. We're kind of comparing this era of NBA talent against previous eras, pretty much the I would say the typical kind of closing piece of their argument is always the average player nowadays is far more talented and skilled than the 2000s, for example. And generally, that's kind of unarguable. I mean, if you look at some of the inter-rotation guys back in, even for final teams, like New Jersey, New Jersey Nets back in the 2000s, and the music are like really bad at the bitch guys. Look at the bitch guys for like the Cleveland Cavaliers 2017, Golden State Warriors. I mean, these are like, legendary players or at least really good players to say the very least. So it's like the the floor has been raised such to such a high degree. I can't say the top level is really much better than where it was previously. I mean I mentioned some of those legends that we've had previously. Even um I, I think see Brian Eden is, is like kind of like the precursor to like a lot of this. Like she had the Kobe cosign. Um you know Kobe's obviously gonna like raise the ele- really elevate the the money the television, the merchandising, all that stuff that you really do need to make any sport kind of break through. Uh, Kobe's going to pretty much like lead the charge there himself. Dolo, really, if he had to. Um, and she had the co-sign for him. So I thought she sounded like a precursor to this. Like, I don't think she gets all of the kind of, you know, recognition for really being like what – I think she predates Becker's by like a year, which is crazy. Like her last year, I think was like right before Becker's first year. That's kind of how long Becker's has been there. But, um, you know, Becker's came in with Clark too. So they kind of came around the same time. But uh, that being said, the individual talent is incredible right now. Just generational and entertaining. And it's real personalities. You go to Clark, you go to Reese, you go to even Cameron Brink. Um, Hannah Hidalgo kind of like a New York vibe to her. Like these guys are, are are just real guys. These gals, real personalities, just real 
stars. And to me, to be a well, a superstar, to be a superstar, you have to have a personality. If you can be a star, like Pascal Siakam, kind of the post Kawhi era, was I would say a star. Like that's a guy that is a really good player, probably a top twenty-five ish player you ever take. Jalen Brown, kind of before these last few years, was a star. Like he was a good number two to number three option. But a superstar, that's where like oh, I think it's like the extracurriculars come into like the non basketball stuff. And I mean, some people feel like that that shouldn't be the case, but if you look in music or entertainment, Michael Jackson is different than Tito Jackson. They might be comparable, like you know, vocal range or whatever. They're not, but. The point being, like, it could be, but, like, Michael Jackson's way more marketable. You know, and even nowadays, like, you know, like, uh, Daniel Caesar probably isn't a superstar anymore because the marketability kind of, like, plummeted after the whole, like, you know, trying to eat Yes Show's ass uh, metaphorically uh, when she's being roasted. He's trying to take up the uh, mantle, protect his queen from being disgusted and uh, discussed in such a way. But you got some guys like Drake that have the marketability. The talent might be there, but also the marketability. That's huge. You got to have the marketability. You got to have the platform. The, you have to be, the, you are a platform, more or less. And that's just stuff you need. You are selling entertainment at the end of the day. You are selling personas, characters, all that stuff. When you're doing these sports, when you're running these sports, your ESPN, Fox, whoever. You're selling almost like a movie in of itself. You got to have your central cast. And to this point, this is why a lot of people, a lot of women especially, or, or not just necessarily women, but like people that that really are ardently supporters of the premise that women's basketball could be more lucrative financially. You have to invest to get the gains out. Most of those people's opinions is that the investment was not done properly into women's basketball, which is why people say they didn't like women's basketball, or at least they didn't, um, weren't able to catch it, weren't able to watch it, didn't enjoy it, blah, blah, blah. You can't really tell me that, like, people, like, I, 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 I just said, like, the talent has probably, the floor has been raised talent-wise. I'll give you that. But you can't tell me it was raised that much in the half decade or so, because this, none of this was happening in 2019. Like, Ionesque, maybe, uh, you know, Kobe was trying to get it going. It was very um, nascent, that movement. But you can't really tell me, like, 2019, this is really much, much, much different a game than 2024. Investment happened. And ESPN, who got the uh, the women's college games, while CBS and um, TBS and that whole conglomerate got the tournament games for men, ESPN had a rooted rooted vested interest in making sure that worked out. That's why you have the fucking the hoodies. They even I don't know if Kobe designed those or I know Kobe rocked them first. Um uh, I think I don't think it was designed like by Kobe. I think he just kinda like had the partnership and deal to to market them. But those orange hoodies that everybody's wearing in the early twenty twenties, uh they had like the WNBA logo on there. Um I believe those came about because of ESPN in part and it's just like they had a best interest in making this work. They also get WNBA games, which I'm not really sure who else gets WNBA games, honestly. I know they do, but I don't know who else does. Um, so it's just it was just investment. They just pumped investment into it. Like if you had Caitlin Clark doing what Caitlin Clark does in a forest where nobody's watching, able to even catch the games, I, I mean, I think she would still have some level of stardom nowadays with the internet and all that, but like, We've seen it with the Pac-12 network. We've seen plenty of great basketball, even some good football, uh, some really good football actually this past cycle. That just was lost. Like, people didn't watch that shit. Colorado games did do some numbers in those uh, Pac-12 slots, but for the most part, like, after the first month where they were getting on ESPN every year or every game, they started doing, like, routine non-ESPN games. You didn't hear about them. On social media, they died down. Um Obviously, started losing games as well, which doesn't help. But the point being, man, if you're not, if you don't have a platform, it's hard to say, no matter how good you are, make any motion. It's just it's fucking difficult. Um, and I mean, we still feel like there's some pretty quality gals that not, that have not actually taken that jump yet in terms of like having the platform. But 
Hendon Hidalgo is probably going to be like one with Juju Watkins, like going to be like nest up with this whole wave. Beckers and all those like gals leave. Um, they had to have the same platform that even Juju has had, you know, um, not comparing or contrasting them, just saying like, I would contend they're both probably very entertaining players, but, you know, one has had a little bit more platform this season. The other one is, uh, I think they're both freshmen. Like, I'm not saying that they don't, like, debate one against the other. you got to have the investment. you got to have the investment. The second point I wanted to make, I've been on this first one for a while. The second one was um, being there for a while, being there for years, being there for enough time to actually, for us to get a million. That's the biggest thing that I think has made women's basketball different. And I do think some people are shitting on men's basketball uh, a little bit unnecessarily, I would say, in trying to big up this point. Uh, because a lot of people don't like the one and done era. Like, I can't really say for, for you know, bad reason. It's really, at the end of the day, the, the, the one and done era has led, led to some fuckery. No doubt. I, I won't argue that at all. Um it's been some bad basketball because of the one and done situation. Um, it's made some college coaches' lives harder. It's made it harder for some of us to like know the players. Like marketability has been kind of tough. And then nowadays, I would say that like you can maybe argue it's because, like I said, the lack of marketability or like the decline of marketability, maybe. But I would just contend that like the personalities are a little bit less developed, maybe, uh, than they were, you know, maybe in the 2000s when college basketball was still kind of hot, in the 2010s when college basketball was still kind of, you know, still kind of there. Um, but, again, I do understand, like, you have to market them. Like, I, I probably, like, realistically, I don't think mm, – I'm trying to think of a good example here. Like someone like Jared McCain, like is Jared McCain a much less interesting person than somebody like R.J. Barrett? Probably not realistically. Like I, I think Jared McCain is at least interesting based on current kind of recent discussion, especially. And R.J. Barrett was a massive name. Just had a lot, you know, kind of bigger uh, expectations, had a bigger platform, playing on you know one of the most hyped teams ever. I'm not going to pretend like marketability is a huge part of like why we come to know some of these personalities more than others. At the end of the day, it's on the really the men's players to kind of, you know, be worth marketing. And it's hard to be that when like, like Rob Dillingham played some of the best basketball you'll see a scoring guard play. Like, that's just a fact of the matter. Like, you watch that guy go out there, he's giving you 30 on just beautiful shot attempts. I mean, I'm not talking just like chucking threes or just blowing past guys' layups. Just some really wonderful shot selection. In some of his better games, at least. And a skill that just oozes off. But that's like a guy that, like, I mean, in a Kentucky of yesteryear, maybe he's like John Wall level hype. I don't know. I think a ton of people know who he is. Like a ton of people expect him to be a top five, top ten pick. I think all the usual kind of outputs after a successful college season are still there for him. He's probably going to still be a star if it holds up for him on the NBA level. But I just think, like, there's something that, with all this that's missing, I, I just think, like, the at the very least, at one point in time, you got the foundation. Like, the, the team core was going to be there. You may lose or gain a couple pieces, but with the transfer portal, not only are you losing the winner dunks, you're also losing – the more or less like the entire foundation, the entire core. Like for Auburn, for example, Auburn after 2022-2023 lost Wendell Green, Zepp Jasper, um, and that was after having already lost uh, Jabari and Walker Kessler in the previous cycle. Um, so they had actually retained a lot of their core, but those are like some really big names that they lost from their title team, you know, just two years removed. Um, I mean, they've had, you know, these early, uh, early entrants, you know, to the draft, George Cooper, JT Thor, uh, they've had transfers, like, I, I am an Auburn fan, so that's why I'm Auburn, but, like, the point being, like, pretty, pretty huge names that they lost, necessarily not because of the players, exactly, I think Wendell Green 
was kind of shown the door in a sense. Not saying like he was bad or anything. I just think like Auburn pushed him out. So keep that in mind. Uh, I do think that people got to understand like not every time where someone is, enters the transfer portal, it's not always because of the player wanting to leave. That's something that I think gets lost because people play the player every time in these situations. Plenty of times I've seen, especially in football, if someone leaves because more or less they're asked to leave. Like that happens often. That's happened at Auburn many times in the last few years in basketball. Uh, but all that being said, we just don't get to know these guys well enough, at least in my opinion. Now, you may get to know the person going to different schools, and you may get to know Hill Love at UNC, the same way you get to know him at Arizona. And the same sentiment still applies. Like You see Baycott, R.J. Davis, Caleb Love all get eliminated, get their careers ended on the same day. You're still like, holy shit, UNC legend Caleb Love just got eliminated, uh, going on as a shield the way that you'd normally see him, you know, missing 10 shots, 10 three-pointers, and to have an overall inefficient game. Like, that's still Caleb Love. But it feels better when you know the player and you know the player for being on that one school. It's the same thing with the NBA. When you have, <laughs> I'm going to into attention here, but when you have it to where Kevin Durant is an OKC Thunder, a Golden State Warrior, a Brooklyn Net, a Phoenix Sun, it kind of fucking sucks, you know, because you want to associate a player with one team. You want to, in your head, like, this guy was, him and OKC were, like, overlapping, right? And you kind of, like, especially when they get older, like, when they start kind of sucking, like, you know, like, ah, uh, you know. I remember Durant, but, like, I, I try to remember Durant from OKC and going to state. Uh, Phoenix Durant uh, played for a scrub team that they cobbled together, and they're going to miss the fucking playoffs, uh, you know, twice. Or they missed the playoffs this season. They made it last season, but, like, that fucking, oh, we still a couple games off of the Nuggets. Oh, my God. It was like, dude. Um, so it's just, like. It's a sense of like not loyalty per se. Like you don't, I don't think I really give a shit of like, like I, I'm not aligned to the team that these guys are going to. But it's just like in my head, like I want to associate the school and the player together. Like it just feels that I can kind of, if I if I hate them, I can kind of apply more hate towards the organization and the player. If I like them, then like okay, I'm not an NC State fan because of DJ Burns. DJ Burns, you know, he's a guy that you know hopefully. I think he's he's out of eligibility. Apparently, he came in the same year as Zion, so he's out of eligibility. But like in a hypothetical situation, if someone became a fan of NC State because of Burns, they could then have Burns for another two, three, four years. He was a freshman, um, and then they kind of like breeds a sense of loyalty towards that school. Like you have those fond memories. Um, I'll give you an example: um, Kentucky when they had Fox and Monk, you would watch. For those two all the time, you kind of be like, okay, I want to see who the next one up. Who's the next guys after this? So you kind of become a fan when a guy stays at the place. But the problem is, like, the guy staying at the place, that concept is, like, almost completely dead at this point. So you're like, well, fuck, you know. I'm a player fan, not a team fan. And nowadays, I mean, we have, like, the whole premise of, like, being a player fan, not a team fan. Like, it's been blown up to such a high degree as, like, guys are, like, now just pretty much – becoming fans of players from the jump now and just saying, fuck the school, fuck the, you know, the team, you know, whatever. You're like, you become a Imani Bates fan. And you're like, oh, I'm going to give a shit where Imani Bates goes. I'm just a Imani Bates fan. It's like, yeah, but that doesn't, that doesn't help the game improve. It just helps you, like, I guess, in being a fan of that one player. Where I think it helps now, uh, you know, with fucking, you know, women's basketball, it's like people are going to be like, you're going to see Hen Hidalgo maybe – uh, Notre Dame finds another comparable level of talent towards Hidalgo's uh, end of her tenure when she becomes like a senior or whatever. And you become, like, okay, insert this chick. I'm a fan of her now. So now I'm just I'm a Notre Dame fan, more or less. I've been a Notre Dame fan for years now. Um, Stanford, you know, you watch Cameron Brink this whole time. They're like, fuck it. They find somebody else behind her. Another Stanford fan. Iowa. Iowa basketball, for example. Iowa basketball had Luca Garza. Who was uh, I think a two-time MPOY finalist? Uh, I don't know if he won it twice, but I know he was at least a finalist twice. And then they produced Keegan Murray, so that's like a you know four or five year period, six year even, where you're like I'm an Iowa fan, and they had Chris Murray too, but not you know the same kind of pool. 
Uh, but usually, like, fuck it, I'm an Iowa fan. I've been watching Iowa for like five, uh, half a decade plus because that's when the players that I fuck with have gone to. That's how you, I think, breed more commitment to the game. There's not like a high level of commitment in my fan, in my opinion, from fans to college basketball, especially casual fans. Like casual fans are not retaining real interest in these teams. It's just players. It's not good. That's not good. And that's going to be these situations where like, you know, people are not like, like I'm not saying people are tuning into these games right now, right? People are watching the games. The games are great. Really good year for for the tournament. Honestly, I'm not going to pretend like it's not been. Uh, some people are upset because of the lack of like star power and like that. Kind of um, but that that's where it goes into is that a star power is being bred pretty much from March on now in college basketball. Before that, people are not tuning in. In women's basketball, you watch Caitlin Clark in a February game against fucking Ohio State because you're about to break the record. You're watching LSU. Um, against South Carolina, you know, the little season because of, you know, the, the personalities they have on that level. Um, and there's some, you know, the qualities of that in men's. Like, I mean, obviously people are watching, like, you know, I, I don't know. Um, I really don't know. I'm trying to think of a good example here. Like, I don't know, UConn against Kansas. I, I don't know. Like, but like, those moments should be, like, show-stopping, like, games. Like, the shit stops when you have those two play. Like Duke UNC wasn't even that big this year. Like can you can you right now, if you're not an ACC fan, can you like retain any real members you had about Duke and UNC this year? I I don't. I, I honestly I barely even heard when those games came on. I watched a lot of college basketball this year. I watched more CDB than I watched NBA. And I I barely even heard of those games like were being scheduled. I think one was I think they played they, they, I believe they played two. Um and then one was, I think, in the second last game of the year. I don't even know the other one was that, though. It's like those games should be like show-stopping moments for sports. It's supposed to be the best rivalry in sports. And, like, people are like, oh, you know. Uh, <laughs> it's like that's, that shouldn't be the case, man. That shouldn't be the case. Um, so that, that's the two points I really wanted to hit. Making sure people stay multiple years would be huge. I don't know how you do it. Some people suggest, like, the – Either you do one year, you do three years, which I think some other sports that kind of model. Basically, that means you can still have the one and done, but if you don't go with that one and done, you have to stay for at least your junior year. I'm not sure that's a, a model they had previously. I think they had the junior year model before, where you had to stay three years if you came into college. And I think you had the chance to go to high school if you wanted to. I think that's how it worked previously, but I could be wrong about that. Some people just want the high school year reinstated, where you can just go straight to the high school. Um, and then you can pretty much uh, weed out a lot of the like the Zions and the RJs and the guys you just you know are not going to be there after the, the the first season. So, so people like like that. I, I don't think with that premise to me is that like there's so many like NBA ready guys nowadays, or at least like high potential guys that NBA teams are going to take and you know waste a year or two trying to develop it to play relative to guys kind of suck. That it's going to be a lot of big names going to college, if that's the case. Now, can college develop guys in the stars? That kind of goes back to what I said earlier. I think they could if they wanted to. Like, I don't see how you can't develop. Like, Drew Timmy, huge name, six-year guy, five- or six-year guy. Like, Corey Kispert, you know. I mean, like... You know, they can, they can still do this. They can still develop those type of guys. It's, it's not impossible to, you know, kind of breed out those multi-year, uh, four-year players. They, they, they can still do that. I think they still can do it. Will they be as amazing to watch as, you know, fucking Rob Dillingham or Paula Bancaro or all these superstar talents? Maybe not. But I don't think people necessarily care about what, the level of play is. I think you just care about like having a really good player that they bond to. And Caitlin Clark to be maybe a little bit worse, but I still think she would still be that huge figure because we all like, are in love with their game. You know, we're in love with what we see with her when she's out there on the court. I mean, lesser play like Juju Watkins is 
you know, um, she has a, a very 2000s esque like shooting guards at the game. Uh, very inefficient, but makes some really wonderful looking shots. Uh, real R, as people say about her. She has a platform. She's a commercial with Joel Embiid right now, the MVP. Like, you don't have to be the best player of all time, potentially, to have this platform of success, you know. So I think they can make it work. If they do like a, a one and three or first year and third year type situation, if they do straight to high school and then you have to stay three years and you come into college, I think they can make that work and still be successful. I really do. And I think it would help those uh, those Dukes and Kentuckys and all those type of like superstar pro- uh, programs that are recruiting like one and does Arkansas and end up getting like kind of diminishing returns on those guys. I think they could, uh, I think they'll adjust successfully. The problem is that like those programs are now like almost like character, 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 caricature of themselves and that like they feel like they have to continue doing like Calipari has pretty much gone on record and saying like he's going to continue doing his program building because his program building leads to Kentucky being bigger and better by way of the NBA, you know, kind of like a indirect promotion. Tyrese Massey, Emmanuel Quickly, Devin Booker, so forth and so forth. He doesn't really have a reason to stop doing that unless a uh, Travis Barnhart, I believe it was the AD for Kentucky, like slaps on the wrist and is like, hey, no more. I think, is it Mitch Barnhart? It's someone Barnhart. I think Travis Barnhart might be a recruiting analyst. But guy gets slapped on the wrist and say, hey, you got to change this up. Until that happens, like he's not going to fucking stop doing that. Obviously, he's not being in real jeopardy for his, his job at this moment. Maybe next year. We'll see. But um, Duke, I mean, Duke has a lot more success in Kentucky in this one and done era, but obviously they're not really getting championships at this point, which is uh, problematic. So it's just something that got to be revised, I think. Uh, I think, like you said, the games are fantastic. Like North Carolina State has had some fantastic games. Uh, Tennessee has a couple of good games. Alabama has some heaters between Clemson and uh, especially the UNC game, in my opinion. Uh, you know, I mean, like – there's still very good games going on. I mean, just last year we had fucking San Diego State against FAU, and that was just a boring bird. That was incredible. Like we're still putting it together fantastic games. It's just I think it could be made better by making these personalities truly investable from the fan perspective of things. You know, I've been going for 27 minutes. I had nothing else to say. Um, like I said, just make them stay longer. Find some way to make them stay longer. And then, you know, just get us invested in this personality. Just get us, find some way to market them to where we truly feel like, like we're a family with these fucking people. And we will never see in real life. We'll never talk to them in real life. We feel like we've been in the same household with them, watching them on TV for half a decade. That's just, that's all we ask for. That's all we ask for.